This is an oral history interview with Leo Baranek. It's October 9th, 2008. I'm Forrest Larson in the MIT Lewis Music Library. It's my honor and privilege to have Leo Baranek back for a second interview. It's October 9th, 2008. Um, and um, Leo was Associate Professor of Communications Engineering at MIT from 1947 through 1958 and continued as a lecturer from 1958 to 1981. He was also founding partner of Bolt, Berenick, and Newman Incorporated from 1948 through 1983, and he's been an internationally respected acoustical design consultant. Thank you again for coming. It's a real pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when um, we were speaking last time, you mentioned that you had played with the Cedar Rapids Symphony at the um, Dvorak um, Centennial Celebration in Spillville, Iowa in 1941. Um, um, how, can you tell me about just the, the, what the event was like um, and did the, or the Cedar Rapids Symphony play other Dvorak pieces as well at that event, do you remember? Oh, I don't remember the program. <clears throat> I remember, of course, the New World Symphony. That was a, the thing they'd have to play. Uh, I remember this was an outdoor, it was summertime. I would judge it was August, I don't know exactly. And it was an outdoor kind of pavilion. Not, but I mean it's undercover, but I mean it's like the shed at, at Tanglewood for the Boston Symphony. It's opened to the surroundings. And I remember the stage being rather steep, and uh, and it seemed to me that I was up at the highest level in the back, uh -huh. and uh, the, uh, the weather was, was good. We didn't have any rain. And uh, I remember... Uh, uh, how careful and how hard I was concentrating not to make any false entries <laughs> because that was a, probably the most prestigious symphony thing that I ever played in. Yeah, yeah. And I got through it without any mistakes. So. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, at this, um, this festival, what, do you remember what other groups and soloists might have played? Were there other orchestras, chamber groups? Um, I have no, no, no memory of uh -huh. what else took place there. I was trying to find some some historical documentation of the events, and I, I just didn't have time to, to go further, and I was just right. wondering if you, if you knew. Were there any um, other particular memories of this event you want to share? Um, Not really. I... I only remember playing. I don't even remember where we stayed. I must have stayed somewhere for overnight that mm -hmm. night. We didn't certainly drive back to Cedar Rapids that night, but we could have. We, well, come to think about it, that's close enough. We might have driven back that night. Uh -huh. And because it'd be a big group to put up somewhere, there probably was not facilities to do it. Uh, I know that uh, we went up on a bus, and we certainly came back on a bus, and uh, the, I, I knew only a few of the orchestra members. Uh, they, uh, I was with them only that one period, that one year that I was working at Collins Radio. And I only got acquainted with a few of the players because I would come in, rehearse with them, and leave. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, the orchestra, to me, was, was I think, uh, as good as... as uh, the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra it might have been better. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it was. Uh, I mean, today's Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra. Uh, it it certainly sounded good to me at the time, mm -hmm. but not as good as Chicago Symphony. I told you about hearing the opening the doors and hearing the finest music I'd ever dreamed of when the Chicago Symphony played at Cornell College in Iowa. Right. Well, at the time when you played with the Cedar Rapids Symphony, they were becoming a professional orchestra, um, and, and now they seem to be a, a highly regarded regional orchestra. That's good. So, I, I, so to um, change topics, um, and this next thing, um, you could obviously write a, write a book and we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about it, but I'm going to take a crack at it, and so forgive me if I'm asking a, a, um, a huge question. Um, um, 
asking you to talk about a, a huge subject that's hard to talk about. Um, there's this mistaken assumption by many that there is an inherent conflict between science and the arts. But as you know, many scientists have been musicians and artists. For example, the astronomer William Herschel, who discovered Uranus, was a well-regarded composer of symphonies and concertos. Albert Einstein was a violinist. In your work with concert hall acoustics, art and science really come together. From this vantage point, do you have any thoughts on the similarities and differences between scientific and artistic creativity? <laughs> well, that's, that's very difficult to answer. I feel that uh, that creativity is in, in people, and some people can be creative, and others just never have, a, have it in them to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I, I've thought about this creativity. In fact, I wrote an article on uh, artists and, and uh, scientists rubbed together. Really? And Do you the, remember what, what what publication I was in? I I think it was probably in a journal, the Audio Engineering Society. Okay. But I'm not sure on that. I have copies of it. I would like to see that somewhere. very much. Wow. And and uh, this was encouraging some people to both spe to major in music and in in physics, and see if there was some way that the one could stimulate the other. And uh, this was my encouragement. And one student wrote me and said that he'd followed what this uh, was suggesting. He'd now been trained and he can't get a job. <laughs> and so he was not exactly sure this was a good path I'd let him into. Uh -huh. yeah. do, do you know what he ended up uh, ended I don't know what, his, what uh -huh. his eventual job was. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and was this an MIT student? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. What what instrument or, or music did they do? Do you remember? You said he was doing bringing physics and, and music together. Do you remember? Well, what? he was majoring in music and yeah. majoring in physics both. Right. Do you know what his instrument was? No, I don't uh, anymore. Yeah. It's too long ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, you've probably had conversations about this topic with lots of your professional colleagues um, over the years, or with other musicians. Well. One doesn't really find uh, that that doing music has helped you do better physics. Mm -hmm. I think that it, it enriches one's life. He feels more complete with the with going enjoying music, whether it's playing, and playing is the best way, or whether it's uh, listening to concerts and mm -hmm. and and. Uh, and <clears throat> taking part maybe in student, uh, if you are a student, taking part in student groups. I feel that this is a, is a good way to make one feel better. It, it makes your life more complete. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, you, you, just, you just feel that this is a, is a good thing to continue through your life. Go to concerts, enjoy music. And, but I can't see any evidence that having done something in uh, music has helped you be a better physicist. Mm -hmm. Can you say that um, um, that um, science helps the, the, the creative um, aspect? Do you think a, an artist's life is more enriched if they have um, a, a background in science? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the, I have no evidence that <laughs> their life is enriched. In fact, this one student that wrote me was sort of feeling I led him down the bad path. That he, uh -huh. had, he had too much of, of, of each, if the, and they didn't make enough of either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think in some ways that, um, particularly from the, the creative as opposed to the performing aspect of music, that um, artistic discovery can inform scientific inquiry? I don't, I don't see how I can remark on that. Okay, I really don't. that's a that's a tough question. That's a tough question. Yeah. I don't have any any evidence. That yeah. I can add. So mm -hmm. I'll have some more questions about uh, music at MIT um, later in the, in the interview. Um, but the topic that we're uh, we were just discussing is a nice lead-in um, to um, questions of 
of um, music and arts at MIT, and particularly the um, MIT Council for the Arts, which you were a founding member of in 1972. Um, just a little bit of historical background for the record in this, this interview. The MIT Council for the Arts was founded in November 1971 by MIT President Jerome Wiesner, but his efforts, but the efforts of his predecessor Howard Johnson, really helped pave the way. And at the time, Professor Roy Lamson was appointed special assistant to the president for the arts. So there was a working committee that. Um, organized the Council for the Arts, but then in spring of 1972 when you joined, um, that was what became the, 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 the founding council. So just for the historical record. Um, um, in um, May 1971, um, Howard Johnson um, wrote the, the following. At MIT, we have long disagreed with those who think that the culture of the arts and the culture of the sciences are separate and immiscible. We find a positive value in an educational program that seeks to give the student an opportunity to understand, appreciate, and in fact perform something substantial in the arts as well as the sciences. Um, and for what you were saying earlier, um, you obviously don't have any disagreements with that. Um, when I was reading some um, archival information about the organization of the um, MIT Council for the Arts, they talked about um, humanizing scientists and engineers and broadening their worldview. Um, do you have any more comments about that? Um, and, um, and then I want to ask the reverse. Um, do you think that um, that people who are trained as artists and musicians um, need science in, in order to really be, um, you know, f f um, well-rounded people? Well, I think, I think any time that you broaden your field and understand some other things, you've made yourself a, a more rounded person. You can contribute better into society. And so I think that knowing knowing music and knowing science is a good way to sort of meet new people, to new fields, new things you can talk about. Uh, you have an interest in maybe traveling to hear music at other places. So you sort of broaden your world culture. And I think, uh, I think that, that uh, either being a musician or a scientist, being in the other one broadens your, your contacts broadens your point of view, makes you better understand what's going on in the world. Now talking about Roy Lamson, Roy Lamson got to know me because I was very interested in the Cambridge Society for Early Music. And in fact, I became its president for a number of years. And I, I, I hired Iva D. Hyatt as the music director of the Cambridge Society for Early Music and we put on concerts in Saunders Theater at Harvard, uh, usually three or four a year, and we got the top artist in early music in the, in the country, and she went to Europe and brought over a group each year from Europe that was a top performing group in early music. And so I got to know Roy Lampson from that. So when this talk started of the Council for the Arts, I guess it was under Howard Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, he had some, let's get together and talk about it before anything was formally formed. I remember Jerry Wiesner being at least one of those meetings. I went to at least two meetings. I can remember only two. And uh, uh, we talked about whether it would be a good idea for a council on the arts to uh, get together, trying to raise some money and help support student groups in particular do something in the in the arts, you know, like music or or other kinds of artistic performance. And um, so, how how this would be formed? Who would be invited to join? And would they join? Would they contribute? We talked about for a year or two before the formal uh, founding of it. And I was for this, and I felt that that there would be possible to get the financial aid from. A number of people, so we could make a difference at MIT. 
Wow. So you were in on some of those early discussions. I sure was. Yeah. Was there, um, were you feeling any pushback from some some other um, people at MIT as far as increasing the artistic presence? Um, well, my main, main contacts from memory were, of course, Roy Lampson and and Jerry Wiesner. Mm -hmm. Jerry Wiesner was always a close friend of mine because he was kind of an audio guy, whether you know that or not. During World War II, he did recording. He was right. He worked with Alan Lomax, the folklorist. He right. did some field recording for And you doing recordings. And in fact, we wrote a joint paper one time. A joint paper was on the sound system that we put in at the at the field auditorium at, at MIT here, the, the big what, outdoor. Well, indoor auditorium, I forget what it's called. Um, which auditorium? Well, it's, it's not an auditorium. It's a, it's a playing field. There's oh. indoors. Uh -huh. And they put in chairs and things for commencement always. Oh, yes, right. Yeah. The, um, What's the name? <laughs> yeah, what do, what do they call it? It's, it's got that, that bubble over right, it. Right, the yeah, bubble over yeah, it. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. Yeah. But anyhow, we wrote a joint paper on that sound system. Right? Wow, wow. Interesting. That must have been a challenge. <laughs> um, so um, you were alluded to this this earlier, um, but there's this um, question about um, you know do arts need justification? And there were there was lots of talk in the organizing of the MIT Council for the Arts for that. Um, but an analog in a scientific world. Um, fundamental, there's lots of fundamental scientific research that doesn't have an obvious practical um, application. You know, theoretical physics is, is a great example. It also doesn't need um, justification um, in the way that I, it seems to me similarly that the arts don't. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Just this, um, you know, people uh, wanting to, to, to justify the arts, um, and oftentimes, you know, they would talk about humanizing and all these other things, but just on their merits. Um, well, it's very difficult to put this in kind of a philosophical uh, context because I never thought much about it in that thing. I've really thought about a scientist being in music as a way of just broadening his life, making life more enjoyable meeting other people and broadening your your acquaintances that way mm -hmm. and in fact my getting into the Cambridge Society for Early Music was a way in which I broadened my interest. I wasn't just dealing with technical groups who were talking about uh, the, 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 the acoustics of some kind of a building or something. Now I'm talking about about music about and, and being with people who enjoyed music enjoyed creating music performances and my being president of the uh, of the uh, uh, Cambridge Society for Early Music was an example where we really put on first-class performances brought in people that were famous and that hall was filled every time we we gave a concert the Saunders Theater at Harvard was filled every time we gave a concert because people felt they were enjoying something. They were getting some contact with genius because we were bringing in great players and, and composers who appeared on those programs. So getting back to the, um, the Council of the Arts, um, at the time, what was your understanding of the mission of the Council of the Arts? You, you were talking about su supporting student groups and initiatives like that. Um, um, what um, what basic need was um, was really being um, filled by the, the formation of this? Because there was academic um, courses in music. There were performing groups, uh, you know, both musical and theater and, and stuff like that. But what what need was being filled by the, the Council well, of the Arts? Of course, I was made a chairman of the grants committee, and near as I could tell, and f the way I felt about it was we collected money from the from the membership of the council, and that made a pool of money that we could we could respond to grants. People responded for made 
proposals for a special concert, a special uh, uh, kind of activity at MIT. It might be a poet, it might be music, it might be lighting. Uh, we, we get these requests of students or a group of students who want to do something and they needed some money. And we could have small amounts. I mean, our amount we were giving were numbers in the thousand and two thousand and three thousand dollar level. And uh, I was on the grants committee and these people would come in with their proposals. We'd meet with them and talk and decide whether it would be something that enough students and maybe alumni and professors at MIT to be interested in we'd support what that student wanted to do. And one of the places we spent more money than anywhere else was in trying to figure out how to house the arts at MIT. And this sort of ended up with the Wiesner building. Right. Uh, that was not our original thought. We didn't think there would be a building, but w we put money into studying how else we could put the music in MIT. And it looked as though they'd be some of it maybe here in this building in the Killian uh, Auditorium. Uh, some of it would be in another part of the Institute. It would be sort of different centers that would be built up for small centers for music. And we put money then in looking at whether it's feasible to develop those centers. Then when the Wiesner building was proposed and, and the president felt we could raise the money, the Institute could raise the money for it, then that whole thing was unnecessary because we came into one place. Mm -hmm. And as you know, it's now being expanded finally. Right. Yeah. Um, when you were teaching at MIT, did you go to many concerts um, here uh, on campus? Well, I used to go to the MIT symphony concerts, mm -hmm. right? And particularly after Kresge was, was available. Mm -hmm. Any memorable concerts that you can think of? Um, not really, in terms of, I can remember, <laughs> I remember things that, yes, I remember one that uh, to me always struck out as being very interesting. Uh, I think the Acoustical Society of America was having meetings in Boston. And MIT group uh, had the idea, well, why don't we uh, get uh, players to come with old instruments, the Stradivarius type of instrument, Guarnerius, and then we compare them with some modern instruments, and we would have these people perform on them and have the audience judge whether they were hearing an old instrument or a new instrument. And so we got together a group of performers and uh, instrumentalists, and they they played in Kresge to an audience, and the audience had checklists or that they were given with pencils to indicate whether they thought it was an old instrument or a new one. Well, it turned out that the audience did judge the old instruments more uh, fa fairly often. That is, they would certainly they were they would pick them seventy percent of the time right. The only trouble with that is I think they could tell by looking at the instrument <laughs> that it was old. And and seemed to me the musicians didn't think of that. When I, when I saw the results, and I'd been in the audience, and I went up afterwards and talked with a couple of them, and I said, it seemed to me that we could tell which was the old ones by the way they looked. They didn't think of that. Wow. There was also a, um, a concert series called the Humanities Series Concerts. There was string quartets and other chamber groups. Did you get to any of those concerts here? Well, well I did from time to time, but I don't remember any particular one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you know any of the music faculty, Klaus Liebman, George, or Gregory Tucker, or Ernst Levy? Well, I knew Klaus Liebman, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, any particular thoughts or impressions of him? And no, we, we talk sometimes about Kresge's acoustics. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, uh, not, not, uh, nothing I can remember that's very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, when we, later in the interview, when we get to um, talking about Kresge, I have a quote that you have in your book from Klaus Liebman about Kresge uh, acoustics, so we'll talk about that then. Um, 
So you mentioned um, Roy Lampson. Um, as you know, he was also an accomplished jazz clarinetist. Did you ever hear him play any any jazz? No, he used to play. Gosh, it runs in my mind that he played clarinet in the Harvard band, even. Oh no, kidding! <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. He certainly he certainly enjoyed playing, and he did play in in music groups. Right. There was a group at MIT here called the Intermission Trio. Right. With um, Warren Rosenau and Art Lichtfeld. Um, Rosenau played piano and Lichtfeld played drums. Um, do you, you never heard them play? I don't remember this. Uh -huh. I don't remember this one. Because from what I hear, Roy was quite a quite a jazz clarinetist, <laughs> and I just wonder. Well, I, um, he was certainly was an interesting man. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, also, as I'm sure you know, he was a scholar of early English music and must have been a recorded player because he, he edited some editions of some um, English recorded music. Um, and this is why he was interested in the Cambridge Society right. for Early Music. Right. Also. Did you ever hear him play recorder? Um, you know, it strikes me that, that I went to his house one time at a party as he and his wife gave, mm -hmm. And my wife was there with me, and, and he played the recorder that night. Uh -huh. So I did hear him play it. And then there's something else running through my mind. Was it Liebman or somebody before him was re making recordings of recorder music? And I was asked to come and, and, uh, and, and help with the making of the recordings to make sure they were done right. Huh. And so those those things went on. Do you know, um, I had never heard about this project. Was it, do you know who it was, was it sponsored by the MIT Music Department or? Uh, I thought so, hmm. yeah, I thought so. That's, wow, that's the first time I've it could It could be, of course, I, it could be that this was centered at Harvard. Uh -huh. These things were, were, many things were sort of joint. Uh, and it could be in my mind coming back now that the music department at Harvard was sponsoring this. Uh huh. And they record where they were the recordings. This was now about nineteen thirty-seven, thirty-eight. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And the recordings are being made. Uh huh. So what kind of um, music? I mean, obviously, you said it was recording music, but um, was it? Um, like small small groups with recorder, or was it solo recorder? And well, they were doing both. The, the whole idea was they were recording some early music okay. and using early instruments to do it. Yeah, okay. I'll have to look into that. I um, think this could have been done by the by the music department at Harvard. Uh -huh. I might be crossing these up because there was a whole there was um, uh, Willie Apple and, and people like that at Harvard. Um, and we're publishing editions of early music. There was that um, that book that I even used in college called the Harvard um, Anthology of, of Early Music, um, and so it might have, might have been something at, at, at Harvard. And, and I don't know whatever happened to those recordings. Yeah, um, <laughs> the trouble was the early recording medium were not very good. Yeah. And so they may just not uh, exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll have to check over at the Harvard Music Library to see if. They know about those. Um. See, one reason I got involved in this, I tell in my book, was that I worked with Professor Hunt in the invention of this very lightweight pickup that would play on vinyl records. Right. And so I think I was brought into this picture there because I'd worked with Hunt and knew how to handle these lightweight pickups, which are brand new. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a big topic. I wish we had time to go um, more into that. Um, just um, for the for the record here, um, you um, were a um, founding member of Bolt, Baranek and Newman in 1948, um, and your two colleagues, um, Richard Bolt, was an electrical engineer. And no, no, he was a physicist. Oh, I was an electrical engineer. That's interesting. Okay, I've got the. I don't know where I got that. Okay, but and Robert Newman was an architect. Architect. Yeah, um, and all three of you were MIT professors at the time. Not not, not at the time. 
uh, Newman had just gotten when we founded the thing. Newman had just gotten his his uh, architectural degree uh -huh. in graduate school, and we wanted to have an architect in our group. Then afterwards, he was appointed I to see. various things. Okay. But at the time we took him, he just received his whatever you call it, his, his architectural degree. Right, and that was was that that was from MIT though, right? That's correct. It yeah, was from MIT. Right. right. Um, and it seems like um, BBN, as the the firm was known, started out as an architectural acoustic. Um, acoustical firm, basically, um, but then as as we um, all know, it went in many directions: communications, computer science. Um, um, but um, for you personally, um, later on in your career, then you really came back to to concert hall um, acoustics. There, there are at least three books on concert hall design and many professional journal publications. Um, so, getting to talk about um, MIT Kresge Auditorium, uh, it was dedicated May 8, 1955, um, and it was designed by um, Eero Saarinen. I was looking at some, some planning documents um, um, and reports from various committees that were um, planning for the Kresge Auditorium, and I found an interesting quote from MIT President James Killian. Um, talking about acoustical design. There was a letter to um, Robert Kimball, who was chair of the Kresge Building Committee. That was, the letter was dated October 3rd, 1950. He says, in anticipation of Mr. Saarinen's visit, may I give you such thoughts as I have about the auditorium. It should be designed to be acoustically right and not have the acoustical treatment as an afterthought or a correction to some architectural design. Um, so Saarinen's um, innovative dome design prevent, presented a real challenge for the call, hall acoustics. And on this point, um, Saarinen is quoted in Technology Review from June of 1955. He says, I have been asked why the auditorium did not have the so-called perfect acoustical shape. Acoustics seems to me and our acoustical engineers, both Branick and Newman, would agree is a modifying factor, but not a science with the authority to impose a basic shape on an auditorium. No study had been made of what constituted good design. We knew, of course, I wish this chair didn't make so much noise, but it probably gets in on the microphone. Yeah. The, uh, the, we knew, of course, that there were good halls in the world, but nobody had ever tried to pull together a story about what would be a good shape. And in fact, everybody sort of believed, and even believed up until almost modern times, that acoustics is a guessing game, uh, it's not a science, and therefore there must not be anything perfect about it. You, might make, you, could, you could sort of make something else and you guess it, it would probably be okay. And, uh, it wasn't until I did my study interviewing of all these different conductors and music critics that I found that there was general agreement, at least on the three older halls that were the great ones of the world, the Music for Ryan Zoll in Vienna, the Amsterdam Concertgebouw, and the Boston Symphony Hall, all of them being rectangular, all of them being shoebox shape, uh, all of them having an audience that was not too steeply raked on the floor, so that there was space in the around the upper part of the auditorium for sound to, to bounce around and and create good reverberation. Uh, the the halls are not too big, although Boston was the biggest of the three. And uh, uh, the only other thing that, that was common was they had good orchestras in them. And I have, I think, too, that part of the reason that that those three were chosen was nobody ever heard bad music in those halls, uh -huh. and so that also makes the hall be great. And on the other hand, there was always good music being played in Carnegie in New York, which was older hall than the Boston Hall, but nobody thought that its acoustics, and even today, are as good as Boston's acoustics. Mm -hmm. Um, so getting back to um, to um, 
Kresge, and you were saying that you know that people had this idea that acoustics was not a a, a science, um, um, but it, it seemed like even at the time you um, you because you had done a, a study of of um, the, particularly Boston Symphony Hall, and you obviously had some some more you know scientific basis for what you were doing. Um, when BBN was brought into the the, the Kresge project, uh, was this after Saranen had come up with the the basic design? I think so. That's that's the way I was brought in, at least. Whether anybody ever spoke to Bolt before that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But when I came into the picture, Saranen had already decided on having what I called half a grapefruit on stilts, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so what Bolt and I knew right away from both physics and electrical engineering was that anything that has that round shape is going to have some very unusual resonances in it. And they're not going to be, uh, they're going to be more pronounced and more troublesome than the kind of resonance you get in the shoebox hall. Mm -hmm. And so we figured that we had to do something to break up those fundamental resonances which are going to be very troublesome. And that's why we developed a cloud system that we put in. Right. Now that cloud system has been modernized recently and is better than, it, than the ones that we did originally because there's been a lot more experience and a lot more studies on clouds. But this was a way of, of breaking up the resonances so that they were not objectionable in the sense they would have been without the clouds. Now there's always been a, a problem and that is because the the front part of the hall where the stage is gets to be fairly low ceiling height that you are really if you put a whole symphony orchestra in there you're putting a lot of power going out from that low ceiling and you don't get this reverberation that you get in an open upper hall that you get at Boston Symphony Hall so that it is not as great for symphonic music as you would like, although for chamber groups it works out quite well. And uh, of course when it opened they they had to get the Boston Symphony to come in to dedicate it, invited all the music critics from New York to come, and the music critics from New York said it wasn't a good hall acoustically. On the other hand, the Globe and the Christian Science Monitor and a couple other reported on the good acoustics for chamber groups. Mm -hmm. So we had a mixed reception for it. But as far as the nation knew, because the New York critics had been here, it was a failure acoustically. I have some, some quotes from some various people about that. Um, you know, back to some of the, the planning um, matters, um, Richard Bolt was chair of the Committee on Requirements for the proposed Kresge Hall. Um, and I found a document dated 1951. Um, do you know, um, was, um, did he have any, uh, he must not have had um, some, some input as far as being able to um, talk with Saranon about the challenges for, for that shape. Was that just really imposed on him and he didn't have any, any say about I that? I don't know. I don't know what the earliest conversations were between Saranon and Bolt, because I think Bolt did talk to Saranon before I got in the picture. Uh -huh. But I don't know what they talked about. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now I do know that all of us got very concerned about rain noise and noise from airplanes coming into that hall. Uh, and so this hall was planned with a covering on the outside that was designed to reduce the possibility of airplane noise coming in and also of any rain noise that might come from pounding on the roof during a big rainstorm. Mm -hmm. So there was a big covering that was put over at quite a large expense. That covering was got got old in time and got giving trouble and was breaking up and so they took it off and never put it back again. So they decided that maybe there was not a serious problem with airplane noise uh -huh. and with uh, rain. Wow. So we'd sort of misled them, you might say, into doing extra thing on the roof that was not necessary. Uh -huh. 
So, as you um, mentioned, there were varied um, opinions about Kresge when it opened. Um, um, some were quite positive and others not so. You did an interview with um, Charles Munch, the Boston Symphony um, Orchestra conductor. Um, this was um, um, October 1955, um, and he was saying that the hall um, reproduces the desired tonal qualities very well. He said it was a good hall for Haydn and Mozart, um, and it would be a good hall to record in. Um, and then um, he says, to, to quote him exactly, he says, it was I who suggested inaugurating the new season, the BSO season, with a concert by the Boston Symphony in the new auditorium. Um, so um, on one hand, he seemed to, um, to, to like it for some kinds of repertoire. Um, um, and then... Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. The um, the interview, uh, the, the stuff I was quoting from uh, was from a MIT Tech interview with a, a student um, newspaper. Your interview with him um, in um, 1959 um, s seems like he's has a little different take on it. Um, he, um, he says that he likes the sound on stage, but it is sometimes too loud. And then Thomas D. Perry, the BSO manager, says, when the sound of a member or a section of the orchestra, um, when the sound of a member or section of the orchestra focuses off the overhead panels onto a listener, that section is emphasized too much. Yeah. Well, this comes about because of the low ceiling. Mm -hmm. And if in the Boston Symphony Hall, that ceiling over the stage is high, and the front of the hall is high, and so the orchestra sound can sort of go up and expand into it without being thrown directly in the face of the people who are in the audience. And the trouble with this low ceiling is that anything that's played there sort of gets focused and fa and thrown right at the at the at the listeners in the hall and it becomes too loud for a big group and that's why he's saying that even sections playing separately sound mm -hmm. too loud mm -hmm. but if you put a small group in there uh, it seems to me the hall does very well by it right so that's why he was saying it works well for Haydn and Mozart that's and stuff right. like that um, Here's a quote from um, Klaus Liebman, um, the music director, director of, uh, di uh, he had the title of director of music at MIT, right. um, and um, and this is from your your book on music um, architecture, um, the uh, first book. Yeah. yeah, right. And he says here, um, he calls it Kresge Hall as opposed to Kresge Auditorium, but he says here Kresge Hall has proved ideal in many respects. The tone is clear and clean. The reverberation period might seem short for the repertoire of the Romantics. This clarity is a decided advantage when it comes to solo recitals, chamber music, and music of the Baroque. Um, and that seems to um, agree with what you um, said. Did you mention earlier in this interview you had conversations with Klaus uh, about um, the acoustics. Is there anything else you want to talk about his view on the Kresge acoustics? Anything else you can remember from your conversations with him? Well, there, there was always discussion about the organ. And I can't quite recall how that went. The, the organ, as you know, was put on one side. Right. And they had an organ concert very early in the history of Kresge. And there was quite mixed reviews on that. Some people thought it was excellent and some thought it was not. Of course, again, there were, if you try to compare how the organ sounded in that hall with what you'd hear in a, a big a cathedral, there'd be no comparison because of the, the long reverberation time that organists like is just not existent there. Mm -hmm. It's a short reverberation time. And so I think the, the, the organists all felt that there was not enough reverberation time but some of the audience thought if you picked the right pieces to play in there, it came over very well, mm -hmm. and therefore it was a, an acceptable uh, instrument. Mm -hmm. I was struck by reading your comments about organists wanting longer reverberation times. I've often been frustrated, um, particularly with Baroque music, and you've got 
um, long contrapuntal lines, and sometimes that detail seems to get lost. Oh, yes. um, and a hall that had less reverberation seems to me that that stuff would be clearer. But you were saying that the organists like this this longer reverberation time. But they they I don't know whether they think about individual pieces or just think about the the whole <laughs> repertoire they may play there. Mm -hmm. But so much of the whole repertoire was composed for performance in spaces with longer reverberation time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of, even some of the Bach uh, organ pieces, he would make stops and would expect the time space right after it to be filled in by reverberation. Right. And this meant that uh, that even in composing, he expected the reverberation to help. Right. But. Uh, you, but you're right. If you go to St. Thomas Church in New York, where they have three or four organs, and they play anything with a lot of detail in it, it just gets lost in the in the general muddle that goes on. Yeah. So there are certain music pieces, compositions in there, which are slower, and and have more stops in them, and so on, that come off better than these very intricate, finely played things. Right. Um, just a couple more um, quotes about um, Kresge. Um, John Kessler, who was executive officer of the MIT Acoustics Laboratory um, in 1955, wrote a letter to Richard Bolt, and he says, The audi auditorium seemed to me to be a magnificent instrument of a stature comparable to the greatest music. And that really struck me. Um, um, do you have any comments about that? Just um, particularly given some, particularly some of your later observations about the the hall. Um, well, I'm not quite sure why he wrote a piece that lauding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, of course, was was it really employee of Bolt and me at the acoustics lab? Mm -hmm. He was called the he was the next person in line after the two of us there, and. Uh, uh, John went to all the Boston Symphony concerts. He was a great fan of the Boston Symphony. And uh, I saw him even a few years back, just before his death, at a symphony concert there. And uh, I'm not sure why he made that laudatory statement. He never spoke to me about it. I almost felt as though that was uh, unne unnecessary. Or <laughs> uh -huh. So he put it on for some kind of personal benefit I don't know uh -huh. it just it just jumped out of me yeah it um, doesn't sound right um, you've done an interview with the conductor Isler Solomon and he's and this was from 1959 he says I found the hall very exciting it was alive and I liked the quality however I have a feeling that a full symphony would be too much what seems to agree with yeah. um, other people um, you did an interview with um, Jack um, Purcell. Is that how you pronounce his last Purcell, name? Purcell. Purcell. Okay. Um, in 1989. Um, and you seem to express, um, not just seem, you were expressing some of your frustrations with architectural shape. Um, and then you say, um, taking a, a quote exactly, it says, Kresge Auditorium at MIT um, Acoustics are not very good for concert music. Um, um, Is that was I was was you being caught in maybe a more um, kind of cynical moment there because um, you were saying that you think that it's it's good for for chamber music and smaller groups. Do you still feel that way, or are you having? But, oh, I do. Yeah. But I get. I think when I said for concert music, I was really thinking of full orchestra. For full orchestra. I, I don't think that's clear, but I think yeah. that's what I okay. meant. Okay. I wondered. Uh, Con I wondered concert music. The word concert. I think in my mind was a full orchestra. Okay. Well, that's good to clarify that because no. I wondered if maybe you had kind of soured on your no. your view of the hall. No. Um, well, that's good for the historical record to have that. So, were there um, soon after Kresge um, opened, were there any acoustical modifications or um, that you did to the hall, or was it um, pretty much left until 1989 when? It, it, well, there was a lot of talk along the way about doing things. I think that we did do some tinkering with the angles of the panels mm -hmm. after it opened, but uh, but there was no change in the number of panels or how they looked, really. Just mm -hmm. some of the angles were, were 
or changed to give it a little better uniform coverage in the hall. But it was always recognized that that uh, that, 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 that this half a grapefruit with the panels is no symphony hall. Uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. So um, in, um, I think I gave a wrong date a little bit ago, 1998, uh, there were some acoustical mo modifications to Kresge by um, a company, um, Ascentech, which s was a s successor to BBN's architectural right. acoustics division. Um, and they used these overhead panels by RPG diffuser systems. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what's your view of the, the results from that? Well, it's better. No question about it. It's still going to be a loud hall, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, with the, <clears throat> the fact it has to be lower in height over the over the performing group means that you're getting a lot of energy out of a big orchestra that's thrown quickly to the audience, and it doesn't have time to sort of expand upward and modify itself before it gets the audience, mm -hmm. which you would have with at a high ceiling. Right. And that probably also explains why the acoustics are best back at the rear of the hall. Right. Well, yeah. they're loud there too. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I can hear details really well even in the back oh, of the yeah. hall. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So um, I was talking with the um, one of the former um, conductors of the MIT Symphony, Dante Anzellini, who conducted from 1998 to 2006. I was asking him about Kresge. Um, acoustics. Um, he also felt that this, the sound was too um, loud. Um, um, and this was even after the, um, the 1998 modifications, he still found that there was great acoustical variation on the stage among the musicians. Um, um, is that a problem that just because of the design of the hall that that really can't be fixed? I mean, I can remember playing on um, sitting in the viola section, can't hearing the person next to me, but I could hear the French horns just fine, or the cello section. And, um, is that just an, a, a problem? Well, I don't know quite what he's, of course, talking about, but it is true, again, with the low ceiling, uh, you're going to hear a full orchestra differently than if you have a chance for the that to expand above you and, and, and mix and reverberate above you. Mm -hmm. You see, I conducted the Boston Symphony Orchestra at Pops. Uh, actually, it was the Stars and Stripes forever, except I conducted it. I didn't just uh, stand there and... and well, you're and a musician, uh, yeah. And I changed tempos, and yeah. and I turned around and, and listened to the sound coming back from the hall, which no conductor ever does, Yeah. and, uh, and uh, was able to uh, get a feel for what happens there. What interested me about my feeling when I was conducting was that the sound that I was hearing was all produced on stage. I mean, above and around and, uh, and, and from the orchestra itself directly to me. I was not hearing the sound augmented from something behind me. Mm -hmm. In other words, this whole business of the height of the ceiling over the orchestra the fact that there's a chance for it to mix and and uh, reverberate immediately there gave me the feeling of what was the or what the orchestra sounded like uh -huh. at Kresge with that s low ceiling you cannot get that mixture you see. I, see I had some questions about that uh, a little bit later which we'll get to but I'm really glad you br you brought that up um, um, so um, BBN also did the acoustics work in, in Kresge Chapel. That's um, right. What are your view of the acoustics in there? Well, I've always enjoyed the, <laughs> the chapel. Uh -huh. uh, we, we had a, an impossible shape there. Anytime you take a cylinder of all things and try to make it useful for anything was a challenge. And we sure worked hard on getting the slope, these irregularities into it, and and getting the thing to, to uh, getting so we killed off the basic resonances in that kind of shape, and left it with fairly good sound, you know. And we feel that was really a success. Mm -hmm. Were you thinking um, kind of primarily acoustics that uh, helped the organ in the hall, or were you also thinking about 
you know, other instrumental groups playing. We were always thinking about small instrumental uh -huh. groups and the organ, both, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. In fact, in my mind, it was more important we make it right for the instrumental groups than the organ, mm -hmm. because I, th I figured that people would know this is not a cathedral. Yeah. And the organ players always want their music to sound as though it was in a cathedral. And I figured it would always get, uh, always be disappointment there. Mm -hmm. But for chamber groups and small groups, we could make it, we could make it beautiful, mm -hmm. and I think we did. Mm -hmm. It's a longer acoustic, you know, the um, the reverberation time is longer than um, you know lots of places that are that that small. But it is um, a remarkable sound. It's a good sound. I yeah. Think. Um, so. Um, Kresge Auditorium was dedicated May 8th, 1955, um, and there was a bunch of concerts and stuff um, even prior to that, but um, like um, earlier that, that week, um, I guess I didn't put my, the date, um, but the um, before the actual f formal dedication ceremony, the MIT Choral Society with members of the Boston Symphony played the, the Haydn um, creation. Um, and then on um, May 8th, the, the formal dedication, um, there was um, remarks from President James Killian, the United Nations General Assembly President um, Elko Van Cleffens, and Sebastian Kresge, and others. And there was a new piece that was uh, commissioned for that by Aaron Copeland called Canticle of Freedom. Um, were you at that um, that dedication ceremony? And um, do you remember hearing the the Copeland piece? And, and it was a piece for for chorus and, and orchestra. Well, I don't really remember detail. I, I just don't. What I remember, of course, was Kresge himself was there. Right. And uh, they, he was. This was on a separate, not one of these big musical evenings. But it was a one daytime, probably that same dedication day. It was daytime thing. And the people gave speeches, and, right? And he finally stood up and threw his hands up over, and he says, "How am I doing?" <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> and he brought the house down. <laughs> <laughs> so he was very proud of this all. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you remember the the Copen piece at all? No, I no, don't. For some no. reason. That's okay. I don't know why. The um, Boston Symphony um, concert that you probably remember um, that was kind of a dedication actually happened in October of that year. Um, was that the one where they brought the New York critics in? Yes. Yeah, so right. then that would be the right. one I remember. Right, yeah. right. Um, that was October of that year. And that's where the, um, the MIT tech interviewed Charles Munch um, mm -hmm. and the quotes that I brought from that earlier. Um, when you were teaching at MIT, did you um, know about the music library and did you ever use it? Was it something you kind of knew about? It's well, I knew it was there. I don't know as I used it in teaching. My uh -huh. course didn't uh, didn't uh, feature music as a performance thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, in fact, the what we put into architects acoustics was relatively short in the whole course because the big interest in my day, the thing I was teaching was was sound reproduction, get loudspeakers and getting getting sound to be right that was reproduced. And see this whole business of of sound in the home was just getting to be started now. And we were trying to give it the right push. Speaking of, of sound systems, the music library at the time, um, during the noon hour, played music um, for, for people over, over loudspeakers. Um, did you have any hand in the design of that sound system? Well, prob probably. Uh -huh. I would think they would have spoken with me. Uh -huh. um, I don't remember any discussion, though. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so a few more questions about um, concert hall acoustics. Much of this is covered in your books, um, so um, pardon me if I'm asking you to, to summarize um, what is really a complicated topic, and you've gone into eloquent detail on um, 
these issues. Um, in your memoir, you mention seven essential acoustics or attributes of good concert hall acoustics. Reverberance, loudness, spaciousness, clarity, intimacy, warmth, and hearing on stage. Um, from a musician's standpoint, somebody who um, isn't going to read your books but wants to know some practical things to take with them as far as when they go into a hall, what do they need to, to listen for um, so they can be a better performer in the context of some of these um, attributes. If you were, if a musician showed up on your door and said, um, I'm playing in this hall tomorrow night, can you help me with um, um, learning more about what to listen for, for acoustics? I don't know if any musicians ever asked me that question before he performed in the uh -huh. hall. <laughs> Uh, they usually are willing to talk about a hall after they've performed it, mm -hmm. but they don't ask for any advice. Uh, and of course, each musician feels that he's going to adapt what he does to what he hears. He doesn't think that, uh, that his playing will remain the same as he goes from one hall to another. So he feels he has to adapt on the on the run, so to speak. He adapts as he hears it going out. And I think that was emphasized in effect with my uh, inter my uh, talking with, uh, uh, what's his name, the great violin player, uh, later on when I talked to... Yasha Heifetz? Uh, Yasha Heifetz, yeah. when he talked about playing in India on an aluminum violin. Right. And he had to correct each of his notes almost to, to compensate for the deficiencies in the violin and make it sound better. So the audience in the end thought it sounded good. Right. But but he had to work very much harder with it. He felt that it was a it was a very difficult thing to play on. Right. But that's with an instrument as opposed to the, the hall acoustics. Right. Uh. But the but the musicians I talk to talk in terms of we will adapt what we're doing to what we hear in the hall. Mm-hmm. And there is that feeling, yeah. but they don't ask me in advance how should they adapt. Because uh -huh. <laughs> that that might be an interesting conversation for you to work with them, so they can better understand what they're actually listening for in the the, the hall. Because your your book on concert hall acoustics has some very practical things as far as what are these different attributes, um, and as you mentioned. Musicians kind of focus on reverberation time as though that's the primary thing to listen for, and you, um, you know, suggest that there's there's much more that they should be listening for. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I haven't had many long talks with musicians. Uh, it's interesting. I have these interviews with the conductors and all. They talk about the different halls in which they like and they don't like, and they do make some general remarks about why they like them. Maybe the bass is strong, the reverberation seems right, uh, the uh, the stage acoustics, we hear each other well, but, uh, but they don't talk about uh, the subject in a broad way. And it's very difficult to get them to even think that way. Mm -hmm. But it seems like musicians could be really well served by doing that, and your book obviously is is attempting to um, to to do that. Um, what I don't know is how many musicians read that book. I yeah. just have no idea. Uh, I'm talking to my musician friends. I'm certainly going to encourage them to, to do that because I have these conversations about acoustics, um, and you know, there's a certain point when a, an intuitive awareness of acoustics can help to a certain point, but some of this other stuff that you're talking about, because you're putting it in musicians' language. Um, um, well, the, all I can say is a few musicians I know who've read, look in the book, considered a way of of uh, getting ready to go into a hall, and they'll read my description on it. It'll be a hall they've not been in before, or they may want to just read about how, what, what do I have to say about Carnegie. Mm -hmm. So they do look at the book from the standpoint of, of, uh, of does it check with their experience? And maybe if they're going to go into a new hall, they will, uh, they'll look at, the, at this, or if they know about the book, they'll read about it in advance. Mm -hmm. What I don't know is how many people do. I do know that James Levine stopped me 
in Symphony Hall one day and said, I've been looking through your book and it's very interesting. <laughs> oh, good. So I don't know what he thought, found was interesting, <laughs> but that's what he said. So some of the um, conductors that you've interviewed, I'm thinking particularly of Herbert von Karajan and Leopold Stokowski, they seem to have a technical understanding of acoustical issues in a way that um, some musicians don't. Do you know if they actually did any kind of formal study of you know, any scientific aspects of acoustics to get? No. No, no they, they got it all either by listening and talking to acousticians. Because mm -hmm. they even seem to have ideas about ideal st st you know, stage dimensions and things like that. So, but it w I guess it was just over their... Their, their experience, uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. And in fact, I think I pointed out in one of my books that interviewing Linesdorf and I think uh, Metropolis and asking them just to tell me the uh, half dozen or more halls that they would rank from they don't like to ones they do like. What I found was and I, I mean, they, these were halls in which music is regularly performed, not just any old hall. And they like the smaller halls better than the big ones. In fact, if you plot their rank orderings against the cubic volume of the hall, it was almost a straight line. Wow. They, they liked the smaller halls better than the bigger halls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was those two men, Metropolis and, and uh, Linesdorf. Interesting. Um, so, um, concert hall shape, uh, it seems like um, there's a consensus about the, the rectangular shoebox shape being ideal, um, and um, Boston Symphony Hall being a, a, a good example. Um, then you talk about um, three other um, basic kind of shapes, this fan-shaped, one you call vineyard, and then arena. Um, can you talk about the, um, the others and... Um, um, and just the, the 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 differences between those and and how they're maybe not as ideal as the rectangular shape, but why these other halls other shapes might be used. Well, of course, the the whole reason for the other shapes are the artists want to do some, the architects want to do something different, and maybe the owners are encouraging them. And in fact, I point out in some of my publications that the first of these halls of unusual shape with a vineyard sort of thing was the Berlin Philharmonie and and uh, von Karajan was the music uh, director at that time of the, of the Berlin Orchestra and uh, Sharon wanted to have something different. He did not want a shoebox hall. And this is the architect, yeah. yeah Sharon yeah. was the architect. Yeah, yeah. And he hired the best acoustician in Germany, Lothar Kramer, to come and, and uh, consult with him. Lothar Kramer says, you're making a big mistake. Don't build a hall this way. Uh, I recommend you stick with classic rectangular shaped halls. And uh, Sharon said, well, he, ta he talked with von Karajan, and von Karajan said, well, maybe the orchestra like being surrounded by people rather than having them all in front of them. So it's worth a try. And uh, Sharun then said, I don't just don't want to do anything conventional. It's got to be unusual. And then he asked Kramer to take this unusual shaped hall with the vineyards in it and make it as good acoustically as he could. Now, uh, Kramer then did influence him into making these vineyard fronts such that they would send the reflections better around the hall. He got the cub cubic volume right so the reverberation is, is equal to that in the best halls. Uh, he made sure there were no echoes. Uh, he made sure there was relative uniform distribution of sound in the hall so that people wouldn't think that, that, that some parts were really very different from other parts. So he did have a big influence on that unusual shape and making as good as he could. But he still was very worried. He went public with this and, and got in the newspapers. The orchestra got so worried that they rented another hall that year in case the objections to this hall were so great that they would uh, have to go to another performing venue. Now, it turned out the hall was a great success but because architecturally it's an exciting hall. 
And there are many good seats in that hall. I would say that two-thirds of them are good seats. Mm -hmm. And they sound a little different from Boston. But remember, Kramer got some things near to Boston as he could. Reverberation time and some of those early reflections are pretty well planned. And uh, so uh, Kramer, Kramer did enough good things to make it approach in two-thirds of the seats what you hear in Boston. Mm. Can you help me a little bit more with this, this term vineyard shape? What, what exactly is that referring well, to? Well, the word vineyard came about because it meant you were putting the audience in little separate boxes around the hall. Okay. And in, in the Berlin Philharmonie, you actually see them as separate little boxes, uh, little trays, you might say, of people. <laughs> uh -huh. And that led to the expression, their vineyards, okay. because they're separate <laughs> yeah. sort of trays. Yeah. Now, the, the surround hall is more the term today, where audiences are seated all around. The orchestra is more in the center. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the uh, Walt Disney Hall in Los Angeles is the best example in this country of, of the concept of a surround hall. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like with um, good acoustical engineering, those halls can be made to work reasonably well. Right? At least yeah. two-thirds of the seats yeah. you can be, yeah. be yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Then there's another category um, you call arena, and that seems to be by far the most uh, problematic. Well, the arena is just where you, you, just, you take, take steep seating all around you and, and, and the performing groups in the center but there's not much place for reverberation to develop. Uh, there's no planning of getting reflections proper around the hall, so the reverberation is wrong. The reflections are not very helpful, what are there. And uh, the whole idea is that the audience is, is uh, seated around the performing group. It's good for prize fights, too. Right. And you often get um, actual echoes. You can get echoes in them, of uh, course. Like the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> when <laughs> well, I was that's such a big one, of course. Yeah, I when in high school, my high school band actually played there, and it was worse than a gymnasium. I just I couldn't believe the echo that, that came. Well, back. they've done some things to help that. Uh -huh. now. They they've hung panels in it, and they got absorbing material on the top of the panels, and and they've tended to tone down this mayhem that you heard. Uh -huh. um, so, um, getting back to a point that you made earlier, and I was, I was really struck, you were mentioning when you get, were guest conducting the, the BSO um, in Stars and Stripes Forever, and you turned around so you could hear the, 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 the sound that was coming from the stage. Um, from the hall, back from, to the Yeah, stage. right. Um, so in that situation, the conductor can seems like can, can accurately um, assess what the audience is hearing. Um, well, I'm not quite sure that the conductor is hearing what the audience does. Uh huh. Uh, and my my feeling was that I was not hearing anything bad coming back from the hall. Okay. No echoes. Uh, I was my feeling still remained that what principally I was hearing was what developed in the in the stage and house itself mm -hmm. that that was predominating what came what the players heard over anything that would come back from the hall mm -hmm. and there was nothing negative coming back from the hall no echoes nothing disturbing and that seems to be the the, the feedback that um, a conductor might use to, to, to assess what's going on but um, but it might not actually be exactly what the audience is hearing. That's right. Um, have you talked about that problem with, with conductors as far as maybe what they can do so they can better assess what the audience is hearing? Well, you know, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure whether to put this on the record or not, but uh, let's, let's not name a particular <laughs> conductor. Okay. Uh, one conductor that I know <coughs> tends to play loud. He, he, he practically doesn't seem to know or be interested in playing at some parts, some music at lower levels, and get bigger ranges in his his dynamic range 
of what the orchestra is doing. Uh, so I, I feel he's always too loud. Then I look at his experience, and a lot of experience is pit conducting. And in the pit conducting, the pit tends to quiet things down before it gets to the audience. So that the soloists, for example, the singers, can be heard over the orchestra because the orchestra is kind of uh, kind of uh, held somewhat into its own surroundings in the pit. You go on the stage, and this fellow's always conducting the pit. He kind of wants to hear the same thing he hears in the pit, and it means that it's it's much of the time too loud, particularly with singers with it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I've talked with them about that, but they don't seem to make any difference. They're going to play it the way they want to. In fact, one time I spoke to uh, uh, Pierre Montour about the the one th one of the things of the percussion were too loud. He says he likes them too loud, but his hearing was bad, and he wanted it louder because his hearing was 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 lower mm -hmm. <laughs> and it sounded better if he could make them louder to compensate for his hearing deficiencies. Mm. So in an ideal situation if a conductor came to you and wanted advice as far as being able to assess what the audience is hearing, uh, um, what would be some things you could suggest to a conductor as far as being able to actually assess what the audience is hearing? Um, better let somebody else conduct and go out and listen. Uh -huh. I'm certainly telling that. Mm -hmm. And I've done this with Leinsdorf and, and others, going out in the orchestra with them and listen together. Mm -hmm. And I was always surprised that we did find differences in different parts of the hall, and their comments about what they heard agreed with what I was hearing. In other words, they weren't sort of hearing something else. Mm -hmm. We seem to be talking the same language. Mm -hmm. So even in a hall like um, Boston Symphony Hall, which seems to have you know really good acoustics, um, is there a, a d degree of, of acoustical um, uniformity from the audience standpoint, or do you still get pockets where things are quite different? Well, there are th a few places where things are different, but sometimes the people sit there and like it that way. For example, if you sit back far underneath the balcony overhangs, both below the first and below the second balconies. The sound is more, it's quieter back there. There's less a feeling of the, of the reverberation above you. You're hearing a sound more sort of direct from the orchestra. And a lot of people like that, and they sit there to get that difference. On the other hand, as far as I'm concerned, I like to get out and get the full effect of the hall. Mm -hmm. Now there's something new They've just taken the covering off of the old windows at the top of Symphony Hall. And there have been a few concerts now, a few weeks of concerts there, two or three, two I guess only, of concerts there. And I've gone to two concerts with the new arrangement. Sitting in the uh, front part of the hall, there is a difference with those windows uncovered. Sitting back in the balconies, back from, away from the, stage. I don't mean the balconies on the sides, but mm -hmm. back away from the opposite side of the stage, from the stage. There, those things make no difference. And so that you would have to assess that by saying, if you look at those uncovered things, they're not just windows flush with the wall. They're set back a foot or more from the, from the surrounding wall. So there is, a, there is a surface between the wall and the window that's, that's perpendicular to the front of the window and perpendicular to the wall because it's, it's, it's in that space. When the sound comes from the orchestra up to those spaces, those surfaces that are exposed now and weren't before are sending back some reflections. But those reflections are only sent back to the front part of the hall. Oh. You can't get any reflection from them in other parts of the hall. Uh -huh. So there is a difference, but you have to be in front of the hall to hear it. Wow. And that might also affect what the conductor is hearing, too. That's right. In fact, uh, Levine has stated, and I heard him state this, that the hall is now more brilliant than it used to be. 
and he's hearing those reflections. Mm -hmm. But if you go back, back of the middle of the hall and the, the back part, there's no difference. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Um, um, there are some concert halls that have um, various mechanisms to change the, the, the shape to, um, to deal with various um, um, you know, size of the performing group and sometimes the, the ceilings come down or sometimes there's certain doors and stuff that can be opened. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about some of those, um, those devices and stuff? Um, and um, it seems like these are halls that are used for multiple purposes. Um, well, that source is one thing. Uh, some halls of modern construction, they want to have it be used for conventions and then want to have it be used for organ music. Yeah. And of course, in conventions, you want a reverberation time as 1.2 seconds. And for, org uh, for organ music, you'd like it to be two to the three seconds. And that's a big range. And if you're going to accomplish that, you're going to have to make some, some changes that are, are visible. Now, Russell Johnson of Artec in New York, uh, Russell Johnson just died uh, earlier this year. Uh, he, he became famous for his, his doors around the hall, which you'd open them up and you could bring in added cubic volume make the hall bigger by opening the doors up. Compared to closing the doors, you have a, a smaller hall. And he, he built a number of halls like that. And some of those halls have worked out to be quite interesting. You do get a big range in, in reverberation, but even to get down the convention size, you've got to put curtains in that are pulled out from pockets, usually to hide them, and they cover the side walls and put a lot of extra absorption in. So if you want to go down to convention level, you've got to put curtains in in addition. If you want to get up to the organ level, you better have some extra volume. You can bring in the hall by opening doors. Now this is very expensive to, to do all of this variation. And uh, now what my experience has been that uh, the, the uh, Johnson tries to tell them, well, if you play uh, Bach and, and uh, some of the earlier music, you want less reverberation, you want the Romantic period, you want more reverberation, so you ought to change your doors according to your performance that evening. What I found is that the conductor usually has made a few experiments and said, hell, let's leave it a certain way. It never gets changed after that. Uh -huh. And they can still pull the curtains in the convention, but they don't really change anything else. He gets one setting that he thought was okay, and he doesn't change it after that. Um, moving to a topic that you obviously have some, some expertise in, um, um, has to do with recording classical music. Um, from your vantage point, um, should a record engineer try to capture the room sound, or does it become a, a different thing because you're actually rec you know, recording it as opposed to um, it being a live concert? Uh, this, of course, is <laughs> a great subject for discussion because yeah. now you're you're recording this in a big hall, and you're playing back maybe in the living room, and and a lot of these recording engineers are thinking today about living room size and with five loudspeaker uh, as a possibility, uh, five or six loudspeakers. So you have one, one or two up front, one on each side of you, and there'll be one in the rear. And this is in your own home. You have the group of loudspeakers. And the recordings are, are, some, are made available with these different things that can be played at once. Right. And so, He's trying to he's trying to put on that disc what he feels is going to sound right in the living room. And it can't be just any location of microphones. It has to be his way of putting this this picture together. And so you have the tone meisters as they call them coming in the picture. 
because they claim that the recordings they make sound the best in the living room. But there is an element of their part of the music in this. Right. What's your feeling about um, multiple microphones and spot microphones as opposed to a stereo pair, um, you know, recording? Well, uh, that, that gets kind of down thing. again how you're going to play this back. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, one thing about spot microphones is that the tone meister can bring up a section when it plays solo or if there's singers he can bring them up a little louder compared to the orchestra and that gives him a chance to sort of monkey with things where he thinks he can improve it by making the singer easier to hear or the words more transparent or even want to bring the sound of maybe the English horn or the oboe out a little clearer. He can he can meddle with this, right? And he does. So what what's your feeling about that as far as from your your vantage point? Yeah. Well, of course, I tend to uh, to listen to a recording and decide whether I like it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I haven't really spent much time trying to dissect how they made the recording. Mm -hmm. I tell in my autobiography the story about being in in the recording house in Moscow mm -hmm. and how they with uh, David Oystrak how they had me judge two ways of doing the microphones and the way that I picked I liked is what Oystrak liked yeah. <laughs> you know this whole issue of you know multiple microphones and uh, and how the the recording engineers um, can even do things that are very different from what the conductor choices might have, have made. And so some of these recordings, we don't know if the end result is really the well, final... Now, but now, wait a minute. What they do, and I've been to some of these big recording sessions, uh, they will do only a part, part of the composition, and all of them will go down the listening room and assemble and listen to it. Mm -hmm. And so that... The, then they may go back and do it again with the recording engineer saying we're going to make some changes in how we do it. So there is some interplay as it goes on, mm -hmm. which may mean they will re-record a part of the composition after the conductor hears it, and, and the, maybe the conductor plus the singing group that's on, it's involved hears it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this interplay. So the, yeah, I, mean, I I know that some of that, but you hear sometimes of some rec recording engineers who really want to put their kind of personal stamp they sure do. on it. Um, they sure yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, a, a, a final question. Um, you know, you're a, v a very musical person. We've been talking lots about music. Can you talk about some of your um, own kind of personal musical taste, you know, you know particular favorite composers, pieces, and just ex um, things so we get a, more of a sense about kind of where you come from musically? Well, <laughs> of course, uh, one, one is always uh, influenced by what he's heard a lot of and what he's enjoyed in the past. He likes to rehear it again. Maybe not too often, but mm -hmm. you want to hear it again. So you look forward to hearing Beethoven's Ninth in a good performance, even though you've heard it umpteen times before. And so uh, there's no doubt about what the odd number Beethoven symphonies I'm always going to enjoy, or Brahms' first and second I'm always going to enjoy. Uh, these are things I've heard often, they resonate well with me, and I like it. Then you come to the things that we're hearing that uh, James Levine is putting on in Symphony Hall, the more modern conductors that he mixes more in. More modern composers. Uh, composers, yeah, yeah, that he's yeah, yeah. composers yeah. I meant, <laughs> that he's mixing in. And my wife and I disagree greatly. She hears one of these, she says, I want to go home. I can't, I can't, I don't, I, I can't hum anything. There's no melody to it afterwards. I can't remember anything to sort of play over in my mind. And my feeling is a little bit that this sounds like a, like a mathematical puzzle. And I enjoy the, the interplay of the instruments, the unraveling of the piece as it goes, goes along. 
I feel that there's a there's a, almost a game going with the music and I enjoy that sequence and I think that Levine and some others do too it's the, the whole effect the interplay of the instruments the lines that interplay with each other the the uh, different tonal effects that come out mm -hmm. and they enjoy this this unveiling this sequence and I do too but my wife can't stand it so mm. and I think that's what you find with listeners and music because you put some of these modern things on half the audience goes home yeah. in symphony hall so you were um, when you came to Boston um, um, there were some premieres of, of symphonies by Walter Piston did you ever know him he had taught at, at, at Harvard um, um, so you must have been around when you were there. No, I, I sent some parts of my book to Walter Piston to read the first book uh -huh. particularly the first couple chapters and I have a letter back from him in which he says that they, they're very interesting and he enjoyed reading them so I had a little contact with Piston but I never had any any long discussions with him about uh, architectural acoustics mm -hmm. other than he said my book was interesting. Mm -hmm. What did you think of some of his symphonies? You, I'm sure you heard the BSO pl play some of those. Well I've never been a great enthusiast of Piston's work. Um, uh, I don't know quite why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, any um, any final thoughts? Is there some some topic that that I that I've missed that um, um, you want to talk about, or just some some concluding comments? Well, I might say that my my feeling of these surround halls is that if you build a surround hall. You can make it so that part of the seats are very good, can sound practically almost as good as a Boston Symphony Hall. The other seats, you got to say, are for people who come to the hall to, to be seen <laughs> as a social event, or there's tourism. In fact, I spoke with the, uh, the, uh, one of the acoustical consultants in Germany who worked with Lothar Kramer. Lothar Kramer is dead now. And he said that the Philharmonie Hall in, in Berlin is always full, but it's only always full because the tourists know they should come and see the architectural difference in this hall from anything else they would have seen. Hmm. So you better be in the city if you're going to do something radical where there's tourists and make people want to come to see the hall because it looks different, not sounds different. Interesting. And that's one, one reason Disney Hall is full all the time. There's heavy tourist attendance because that hall, particularly outside of it by uh, Gary, yeah, is, by Gary, is something they got to come and see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This has just been um, fantastic to, to talk to you, and uh, I think we've... Um, I've certainly learned a lot, and I think for the historical record, it's 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 really it's really valuable. Well, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> so. It's been a pleasure being with you, and I'm glad you did your homework before you started questioning me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>